see why Melissa chose a psalm last week? The uh, <laughs> thanks be to God doesn't really roll off the tongue when we hear Jesus talking or John the Baptist talking um, because this is not exactly the most wonderful time of the year kind of scripture reading. You know the scene from uh, Charlie Brown Christmas? Most of you have seen Charlie Brown Christmas, I hope, at one point or another. Okay. So there's a scene in that where, you know, Schroeder is at his little piano and Lucy is swooning over him, you know, uh, with her head up on the, the little piano. And she says, uh, hey, can you play Jingle Bells? Remember this scene? And he plays it, and in the magic of the cartoon, it becomes the conventional piano, and he, and he plays Jingle Bells, and she says, no, no, Jingle Bells, you know, deck the halls and all that stuff. And so he p tries again, and this time it sounds like a Hammond organ with the pipes and all of the beautiful chords. And she says, no, no, you don't get it at all. I mean, Jingle Bells. You know, Santa Claus and ho, 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 and mistletoe and presents to pretty girls. And with a scowl on his face, he plunks off key the toy piano that it is. Doink, 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 doink. And oblivious to his scorn, she cries, that's it. We want baby Jesus and shepherds and angels, and instead we get John the Baptist. That is not the same thing at all. No, no, no. We want mistletoe and presents to pretty girls, and John is not. <laughs> not those things. Forget peace on earth. John is talking, and in some translations, I like the translation a little better because it's easier to spit it out, although you did a really nice job of, of, you know, you children of snakes. But in some translations, it says you brood of vipers, and that's just easy to spit, right? <laughs> this is not very Christmassy stuff. This is not jingle bells. There are no wall hangings or ornaments on the tree that say, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? or the ax is at the root of the tree. There's not even a tendency to put, uh, produce fruit that shows that you have changed your hearts and lives. See, Matthew's gospel, Matthew doesn't have choirs of angels and shepherds. Matthew has a dream for Joseph and a visit from Magi that results in a bloodbath of young children, causing Jesus to become a refugee. Gospels have different stories of Jesus' birth, and Matthew's is one of the darkest. But all of them mention John. And John is not nice. John is not charismatic or charming. He doesn't dress well. He doesn't smell very good. But people from Jerusalem come to him. And that's crazy. I mean, then, as now, people tended to coalesce in cities. And so they are going out to the desert. So this is a reverse commute. And they're not going out to cut down their own Christmas tree or to go to a nice craft fair and to get their dose of a quaint country Christmas for the holidays. They're going out to be baptized, but in order to do that, before John will even really talk to them, they first have to confess their sins. And that's where you brood of vipers comes in. If you thought you were going to get baptized as this warm, fuzzy, or, or a benign ritual, you are sorely mistaken. People travel out to this smelly weirdo to admit not just that they made a mistake or that other people were mean to me and, and you know, they made me do it. People go out to confess their sin. And that seems absolutely nuts right up until it doesn't. 
Because much of this season, and truth be told, much of our entire lives, we pretend that things are just great. Thank you very much. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Couldn't be better. We don't talk about sin, at least not mine. <laughs> I might be in debt, but isn't the house beautiful? My kids might not be speaking to me, but you can't tell that from the smiling faces and the family photo. My loved one's depression gets revealed in anger, but we're sure looking forward to retirement. I'm in church, so my faith is really strong. I have a way of life that works just perfectly. Thanks. Merry Christmas. Truth be told, I really like John. Because John rips that mask right off. John is not about pretenses in any way. And I think the reason that John is such an important part of the good news of Jesus is that if everything's great, we don't need a savior. If we're all just hunky-dory, then there is nothing, no point to the Christmas story. Everybody's excited about a baby, but babies grow up. And sometimes those babies grow up and do and say really hard things. Sometimes they even turn on us. See, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're probably dead by the time John grows up and gets preaching these difficult messages, but Mary isn't. The same woman who, in a different gospel, sings a song of the lowly being lifted up and the prideful being brought low is still around when Jesus is teaching and she wants to interrupt him, kind of rein him in just a little bit, and Jesus says, Who are my mother and my brothers? She's still around to hear these things. And some of us know the difficulty of having a child who we so anticipated and loved when they were an infant becoming old enough to say really hard and hurtful things, to travel down paths that we never in a million years would have wished for them or for us. This is the baby we're waiting for. The one who speaks truth, we don't always want to hear. And yet, then as now, people come. People come perhaps because they're tired of the mask. They're tired of pretending to be okay, of writing the Christmas letters that pick the high points of the year and ignore three quarters of it. They're tired of pretending that everything's okay when deep down they know that everything's not really okay. <laughs> They're tired of living stressed out lives of mere existence rather than living life abundant and everlasting. But to get to that point of living life abundant and joyful and all of the things that, that the prophets predict that will come when Christ comes, something has to change. And that means that we have to give up some things. If our cup is full of resentment and jealousy and depression and addiction and negativity and debt and fear and anger and greed and all of those things, then there's no more room to pour in mercy, to pour in love, to pour in hope, let alone joy. You have to get rid of those other things in order to make room, and that's what John was preaching. 
you can get rid of that stuff. Confess it. Now, as Protestants, we're not really big on that whole confession thing. Right? But there, too, I think we've kind of lost something. Because the funny thing about speech is that you can't speak without exhaling. Try it. And so when we speak our sin, it physically leaves our body. When you exhale it, you can breathe it out. And I like the image of baptism in this as well, because you can breathe out underwater. <laughs> it's not a good idea to breathe it back in. Right? And so one of the things that we claim happens in the sacrament of baptism is that we are washed clean. And in part, that is because we can breathe out. We can exhale our confession and trust that Christ will wash it away, that we are not even allowed to breathe it back in again. And that, perhaps, is what people are drawn to for John at the river. That's the, the Christ that we await. The tunes that Schroeder plays at that little piano are layered and complex, and that is not what Lucy wants. Lucy wants easy, happy, simple, Anything resembling a chord might start to resonate. And that might lead to something deeper and more complex. So I wonder this year if we're waiting for jingle bells or if we're waiting for the hallelujah chorus. If we're waiting for a baby or if we're waiting for a savior. Because maybe the best gift that we can give to Christ on Christmas is the mask that we wear. The baggage of fear and shame and greed that we carry. Maybe we can breathe out our sin under Christ's living water to prepare space for the Savior. May it be so.